This is section 1.2, Finding Limits Graphically and Numerically. All right, so we're going to start today talking about graphing a function. And this is a review from earlier work, uh, probably college algebra and or pre-calculus. You may have talked about graphing things that look like this. Um, you should know that the domain doesn't allow for x to be 1 because that will cause you to divide by 0. So um, except for at 1, we can use regular curve sketching techniques. So um, let's talk about that. Um, for one thing, you might want to start by factoring that difference of cubes. And so that'll be the cube root of the first thing, keep the sign cube root of the second thing, and then looking at that binomial, square the first thing, change the sign, multiply the first times the second thing, x times one is x, plus then square the second thing, one. If you've forgotten how to factor some things, you might want to uh, review factoring. Uh, because you know, that's obviously an algebraic skill you should have walking in. So as long as x isn't 1, that is going to be equal to x squared plus x plus 1, which is a parabola um, that opens upward because the coefficient of x squared is positive, positive 1. Um, to find the vertex, of that parabola, we can find the um, x-coordinate called h, because the vertex generally is called um, hk. Um, h, the formula for that is negative b over 2a, where a is the coefficient of x squared, b is the coefficient of x, and c is the constant. And so that's going to be the opposite of 1 over 2 times 1. So negative 1 half. Then to find the y coordinate, we substitute that x value in. So that would be negative 1 half squared plus negative 1 half. plus 1. That's 1 fourth, negative 1 fourth. So I believe that's 3 fourths, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so then we know the vertex is at negative 1 half, 3 fourths, assuming I haven't made any silly errors in my arithmetic. And uh, so graph would look like this. Well, as soon as I get enough marks on here to start graphing, I'll graph it. Okay, so negative one half, three fourths, about right there. Um, to find a couple more points, we could say, well, if x is 0, y will be 1. And if x is negative 1, um, negative 1 squared is 1. Okay, so that's 1. And um, as long as we don't let x equal 1, those are three points from this parabola. So I'm going to kind of not worry too much about getting a whole bunch of points. I know that that's the vertex, the low point there, and it goes like this. Now when we get to one, we can't do anything because we haven't figured out what's going to happen. There. Okay. So um, if you look at a table of values, and this is the you know, new, using numbers, a numerical approach, if you make a table of values, um, for x values near 1, you can discover the behavior. 
So I don't know if I have this table copied in your notes or not, so I'm going to write it down. And if you're having to um, look at something that's already printed, I apologize in advance. So I'm getting x's that are close to 1. Right now I'm on the left side of 1 with 0.75 and then 0.9 is even closer to 1 on the left side of 1. And then 0.99 is even closer to 1. And if you want, I can show you in class, if you'll remind me, to um, how to create uh, this table of values really quickly on your calculator. But the idea is you want to be able to put in whatever number you want for x and have it automatically calculate y. So you can get these um, really good values. Okay, now on the right side of 1, super close to 1 on the right side of 1 is 1.001, which has this y value. And not so close to 1, but still pretty close. We get this y value. And even further away from 1. The back half of this looks like I'm, I'm working backwards, but it, uh, it's, it's on purpose. So if you look from the right and move toward the left, um, those values are getting closer and closer to 1 as you move this way. And these values over here are getting closer and closer to 1 on that side. And so using that as numerical evidence, what y value would you assume you're getting closer and closer to when x is 1? Well, it's not equal to anything at 1 because there's x can't be 1 for this function. But what value is it getting closer and closer and closer to is the question. And it appears that it's getting closer and closer to 3. But x can't be 1, so we won't get a point there. So what we'll do instead is all of these values, the closer we get to 1, the closer our answer gets to 3, which I didn't do a great job of graphing that. Um, it should be up here. It should be right there at 3. So darn it. Let me fix that because um, this graph needs to be a little bit better looking than what I made it. Uh, because I only had those three points, if you recall, so I wasn't very accurate in my drawing. So please pardon that. I'll fix that now. I'll make it look a whole lot better. Okay, so this curve goes more like this. Like that. Okay. And the side does pretty much the same idea because of the symmetry of that function. And so what we're going to do right here is we're going to draw an open circle because the closer you get to x being 1 and not being 1, the graph just, just continues to get closer and closer to 3. On the left side, you're below 3 because it's going up toward 3. And on the right side, those numbers are above 3. So coming from the right, um, we're headed towards 3. So this is a big idea um, that we've just encountered. What we're looking for is the number that y approaches as x gets closer and closer to 1 in this case. What y value is this graph approaching? And that's where the limit comes in. So kind of keep what I just drew in mind because that's a pretty big idea. Okay. Um, and if you look at the graph, of course, um, it also says that the closer x is to 1, the closer y is to 3, although it's not equal to 3 there because x cannot be 1 in f of x, uh, the original f of x, because that would have you divide by 0. Um, so a way to formalize our 
graphical and numerical approach is to make a statement like this. The limit, that's the y value that it's approaching, the limiting value for our function as x approaches 1. And if you look at a typed version of this, limit and x approaches 1 are each half size. And that equals about the same size as f of x. Um, now, give or take a little bit. Um, that that limiting value, the value that y is approaching, that f of x is approaching, as x gets closer and closer to 1, is 3. Okay, so that's a mathematical statement that says um, that the closer x gets to 1 for this function, the closer the y values are to being 3. Now notice at this um, juncture, it's not 3 at 1, and that doesn't matter. It's what it's approaching as a y value that matters. It's not what it is actually being at 1 that matters. It's what it's getting closer and closer to as x gets closer and closer to 1. And that's a pretty huge distinction because I'm not worried about whether f of 1 actually exists or not. I just want to know what's happening as I get closer and closer to 1. What y value is it approaching? Okay, so um, an informal definition of the limit is this. If f of x becomes arbitrarily close to a single number l, like 3 in this problem, as x approaches c, 1 in this problem, from either side, that's important, from the left side of 1 and from the right side of 1, all values, as you get closer and closer to 1 from both sides, are approaching 3. Um, the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. And so in a more general sense, we would say that the limit as x approaches c, which in our problem was 1, of our function is equal to the limiting value that y approaches, which we'll call l, the limit. And we use a capital L for that. Okay, so let's look at an example. f of x is equal to x divided by the square root of x plus 1 minus 1. It says, let's evaluate this function at several x values near 0 and use the results to estimate the limit. Okay, And the limit that we're trying to find is the limit as x approaches 0, according to the directions, for the function f of x, which we can use the name f of x, as I did above, or the expression of f of x as a function, which I'm doing now. Okay, And we want to find out what that's equal to. So this is a numerical approach. We're using numbers in a table to help us figure this out. So. Uh, I'm going to start on the left side of 0 at something that's fairly close. And I get an answer of 1.99499 when x is negative 0 0.01. Even closer, negative 0 0.001. Notice how close we have to get uh, sometimes. Uh, to our target value to see what's going on. Um, you might already have a guess, and you may be right, uh, but sometimes you have to get extremely close. And so I'm just showing you some possible x values that are close to zero that you might actually use to make sure you're doing this correctly. Okay. Then at zero, that's what we don't know. So extremely close on the right side of zero gives us an answer of two point zero 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 five. And again, I need to show you in class 
uh, a way to automate this and arrive at these answers without having to actually type each of these x values into that function um, one at a time. That's like the worst exercise in futility I can think of. Uh, a big waste of time. Okay, so as x gets closer and closer and closer to zero from the left side and from the right side, what y value do we appear to be seeing as an approaching value for y? I would have said 2. And so I would estimate the limit to be um, 2. And of course, uh, you might look at that um, and see, well, could I have just found out what f of zero is? And perhaps that would have been informative. So if I try that in the denominator, the square root of zero plus one is the square root of one, which is one, and one minus one is zero. So no, substitution would not have gotten me anywhere there. So this numerical approach, or if we graph this and looked at the y values, the y value that we seem to be approaching if we're coming from the left side of zero and from the right side of zero, um, that y value that it's approaching should be two. And I think I put this um, graph in your notes, but if not, I'll, I'll quickly sketch it. Just so you have an idea of what the graph looks like. If I didn't put that in there, intended to, but possible I messed up and didn't. Okay, so the graph looks sort of like this. And when x is 0, there is no value. So since it's approaching 2 from the left side and the right side, then we can put an open circle there to represent the fact that no, as x gets closer and closer to 0 from the left, it's approaching 2. And closer and closer from the right, it's approaching y equals 2. At 0, there ha actually is no value. But we put an open circle at 0, 2, representing that we think that that's the y value that's getting closer and closer and closer to as x gets closer and closer to 0 from both the left side and the right side. OK, so next, we're supposed to take this limit as x approaches 0 of the absolute value of x divided by x and show that it does not exist. And we'll get does not exist as an answer for a limit question enough that I want to introduce to you right now a symbol. Right not much of a symbol, it's actually three letters, that we'll write when we want to say does not exist for short. Capital D, capital N, capital E is does not exist. And we'll use that abbreviation quite a bit. Okay, so the first thing I want to remind you of from algebra is the algebraic definition of the absolute value of x. If the number I put in for x is greater than or equal to zero, like 7. The absolute value of 7, I get back 7. So the absolute value of x, I'll get back x. Think of any number you want that's 0 or bigger. The absolute value of 0, I get back 0. The absolute value of 2, I get back 2. Okay, So that's the easy half. When x is negative, what do you get back? Like the absolute value of negative 3. Well, that's positive 3. And the way to say that algebraically is, is, since x is negative, I would have to take the opposite of that negative number to get a positive answer. So do you agree that the opposite of negative 3 would be 3, the absolute value of negative 3? Yes, that does work. And this is the algebraic definition of absolute value. Um, so if we took that expression 
and divide it by x. Well, when x is positive or equal to 0, that will be x replacing the absolute value of x divided by x. Oh, now I see some a problem here. I was about to say greater than or equal to 0. But of course, since I have x over x, I can't let the denominator be 0. So I have to take away that or equal to 0 because it doesn't make sense. And then absolute value of x over x, when x is negative, I'll replace the absolute value of x with opposite of x, then divide it by that x. And so that simplifies to be 1 when x is greater than 0 and negative 1 when x is less than 0. And so uh, if we were to graph this function where f of x is absolute value of x over x, You may notice that I'm taking some pains, and hopefully I always do this consistently. I'm taking some pains to always label the axes, uh, x and y, because as you know from pre-calculus, um, th there are other variables that could be there, like the horizontal axis could be the real number uh, axis, and the vertical axis could be the imaginary number axis. And so it's really important to label um, things. But anyway, um, back to our problem. So as long as x is less than 0, like at negative 3, I'll get negative 1. Negative 2, I'll get negative 1. Negative 1, I'll get negative 1. Negative 0.5, I'll get negative 1. I'll keep getting negative 1 for any x value that's less than 0. So that's going to be a horizontal um, function and it goes forever to the left. Now x equals 0 there is no value but the closer I get to um, 0 from the left I'll keep getting negative 1 until at 0 I won't get anything. Now when x is positive like at 1 the answer is 1, 2 the answer is 1, 3 the answer is 1, 74 the answer is 1, 0.5 the answer is 1, 0.01 the answer is 1. So as long as I'm just getting closer and closer to 0 without being 0, I'm always getting 1, which means this is always 1 out this way. But there is no answer at 0, so I'll put an open circle there to say that the closer I get to 1 from the right side, I'm getting closer and closer to 1, whereas um, as I'm approaching 0 from the left side, I'm getting closer and closer to negative 1. And if you remember what I said earlier was that you have to be approaching the same value from the left side as you are from the right side of your target, which our target is zero. These do not approach the same thing. And um, we'll say then that the limit as x approaches zero of this, because we don't approach the same thing from the left and right side, this limit does not exist. Notice there's no equal sign. The limit does not exist is basically how you would read that. Okay, So if the left and right side approach different numbers, the limit doesn't exist. If it does approach the same thing from both sides, like this one here approaches 2 from the left side and the right side, that's why we could say that that limit was 2. All right? Okay. So. Um, there is a uh, very formal way of expressing this, and I'm not going to hold you accountable for this, and I probably won't even talk much about it. But what it says basically is um, that if you get arbitrarily close to C, in this case 0, from the left side and right side, and if those arbitrary selections of what we call delta, if uh, the lowercase Greek letter delta, that can stand for any small positive number. So 
As long as you're from negative delta to zero, no matter how small delta is, the answer is negative one. And from zero to delta, no matter how small delta is, the closer you'll be to positive one for y. Uh, so that's kind of heading towards the formal definition of a, of a limit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how a limit can fail to exist. Um, f of x could approach a different number from the right side of c than it approaches from the left side. That's the one we just saw. From the left side, the function approached the value of negative 1. From the right side, it approached the value of positive 1. Um, number 2, f of x could increase or decrease without bound as x approaches c. So let's say that we had a function that looked like this. say x uh, is approaching c, which is 4. And as we approach 4, um, from the left side, the answers could go up without bound. Or, say from the right side, let's say that they approach negative infinity. They go down without bound. And of course, you may know what we call the event of having this kind of behavior at 4, is that there's a line at x equals 4 that the graph is approaching. Do you remember what that line is called? It's called a vertical asymptote. And then we say where it's located at and then you give the equation of the line that we are approaching, and that would be x equals, because it's a vertical line, x equals the number 4 in this case. And I'll abbreviate that vertical asymptote at x equals 4 in the future. Okay. But that's, those are the actual words, but that's the abbreviation we'll use. And then another thing that could happen is... Um, that f of x could oscillate between two fixed values of x as x approaches c. So let's see what that might look like as x approaches c. Let's say c is right here. Um, and we have a graph that looks like this, perhaps. And what's happening is the period is changing all the time, but we're still getting answers between negative 1 and 1. No matter how close we get to C, we're still going up and down between negative 1 and 1 from the left-hand side. So it's not really approaching a single value. There's actually always, no matter how close you get to C, you're going to end up getting every number between negative 1 and 1. No matter how close you get, you're going to get one of those numbers. And from the right side, we could say, well, what if it's doing the same thing? And it will, uh, what I'm envisioning. So the closer you get to C, uh, the smaller the period becomes. And no matter how close you get to C on the right side, the values just keep going between negative 1 and 1. And so there is no limiting value here. So let me go back and make the statement that you would want to put here. For this one over here that we just talked about, the one that has a vertical asymptote, the limit as x approaches 4 for that function, we would say does not exist, d and e. And for this situation over here, the limit as x approaches c of whatever function that is, also does not exist. Okay, so that ends this recording. Um, I will see you in class.